The streets will never make you grow. It's not a seed, it's a gutter. There's no happy endings in this life. So this is my message to you. The streets will never love you back. Pow. What's up, guys? Well, tonight we got another special guest, and I'm very happy to have him. I was on his show for uh, a couple weeks ago, and he's out of Boston. He's uh, from the North End. He's hell of a nice guy. And, uh, you know, he there's so much about this guy. You know, uh, he's a pleasant guy. He gave his life to God. He was one time a wise guy. And uh, I guess he's seen the light. But he's very wise. So, Bobby Luis is here tonight. And uh, I'm looking forward to this. Let me give a couple of shout outs quick. My Boston J, my moderator, Live and Let Live. Miss Can't Be Wrong, Richie. Gianni Catano. Robert Feebles. Dormery. Sling Blade. James Lund. And all you guys out there. I'm so happy you can make it tonight. I appreciate your support. The love you give me, and it means a lot to me. So let me put on Bobby Louisi. Hey, Bobby. Hey, what's up, my brother? Thank hey. you for having me on tonight. No, absolutely. You know, I did your show a couple of weeks ago, and uh, you know, I'm so happy I met you, and uh, you became a friend, and I'm happy to be here tonight with you on my show, and it means a lot to me. It really does, you know. And uh, you know, I really don't, my brother. And, and, and the thing is, you know what? I really don't know much about you. You know, I know a little about you. You're from Boston, the North End. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you're a Boston guy, and then eventually, uh, you know, I know there was a war out in uh, Boston, and a couple people in your family were murdered. Mm -hmm. You know, my condolences on that. Thank and you. uh, you know, it's a sad thing because in this life, you know, there is no happy endings. No, no, there isn't. But uh, you know what? Let's start at the beginning of uh, where you're from. You know where your grandparents are from, and where you come from, as far as people. Well, on my mother's side, they come up from around Palermo, Sicily, and the Luisi and Madarazza side were all around Rome. Actually, one of my uncles was a chief inspector in Rome. So that's where my family comes from. And then they settled. They came in Ellis Island, from what I understand. And a lot of Luisi stood in New York. But, uh, most, you know, some came up to Boston. My grandparents came up from Boston. They kicked out of the country. And uh, so eventually, uh, eventually you become a wise guy. Okay? Now, the thing is, how did you get there? As, as, a, as a kid... You know, what did you see as a kid? You know, I think your father was in the mob. Yeah, my father was uh, an enforcer associate for the mob. Um, so I grew up around all wise guys, made guys, capos, in the North End. See, the North End was the hub for, for Boston wise guys. Everything, the Angelo family ran out of the North End and three of the capos. So, I mean, there was always people around in the North End, in uh, East Boston. And at a young age, I was working for the Angelo family for own bending, uh, doing the pinball machines and all of that, dime machines. So I was always exposed to it since I was a young kid. Hmm. It's like a, a familiar story, you know? Yeah. You hear mm -hmm. these stories constantly. And, uh, you know, as a kid, 
when did you realize your dad, you know, was a knock around guy, a street guy, and you wanted to be like him? Well, I'll tell you a story. I heard that. I heard that he was in, uh, you know, he used to give me and my sister support money, $25 a week each. And I used to have to go up the combat zone. I think I was 13 years old to the strip joint that I used to run. And that's really where I started getting exposed to everything. You know, plus early before that, I worked for Ronnie Rome and the Angelos. And I knew my father was a heavyweight. But really being around my father was probably up in the strip joints, going up there once a week. You know, and then 16 years old, I moved in the North then, back to the North then from East Boston into my father's building. And I was around these guys every day. Now, now the strip the strip joints, did he have something to do with them? Oh, yeah. He used to run them. He was the muscle. Hmm. You know, he used to run it for the wise guys. You know, he was the muscle up there. My father was a proposed guy. Uh, two different times, you know, but that didn't work out. He never got made. If he didn't get killed, he would have got made this time, you know, but uh, he was proposed. And uh, what year was he killed? I think it was October 95. Mm. I'm sorry to hear that, Bobby. Yeah. And, uh, so tell me about, you know, when... You really wanted to, when you realized you wanted to be a part of this life. Well, like I said, about 16 years old, I was hanging around uh, with uh, Johnny Chicotti, who's a May guy, on the Larry Bione. Uh, Rafi Chong had a big name in Boston. And um, I used to go in the Melanopoly around those guys every day. And uh, I liked it. You know, we used to dress up a little, go in there. And, uh, but at that time, too, Jimmy, I was working at carpentry after school. And at 16, you know, I was offered a full-time job of 400 a week. So I started doing that, too. But mostly I did that in the summer. And the rest of the time, I hang around with my father and around all these people. Um, but I'll tell you, uh, I was probably 18, 19 years old. I really decided I wanted to be a carpenter and a builder. 20 years old, I got a builder's license. And I tried to go that way in my life. Even though I was around these guys and I seen what the life was like, I still was trying to do it legitimately. You know, Jimmy? So what pulled you away from there, from that job to the street? Well, what happened, uh, I was building houses on Martha's Vineyard. And I had a condo back up here in Boston, too. And uh, the market crashed. And I had three houses I was sitting on down there, my condo back home, and I lost everything. So I come back in 1990, and there was nothing else for me to do. You know, it was like I did everything but go bankrupt. So I had no credit. I had, you know, no means of support. I was aggravated with the carpentry work. I worked all those years, built up, and all of a sudden everything was gone. So I put a gun on my back, uh, the back of my pants, and I went out on the street. That's what started everything. I was 30 years old. And you hit the street. What were you doing? Robbing drug dealers? Shaking some down. Uh, I started selling drugs. I had a card club in East Boston. I had one in the North End, too. We had a bookmaking office. We were doing everything. Doing everything that we could. That we knew to do. You know? And uh, But I ended up getting in the drug business, Jimmy. And that's where all the money was. Yeah. I know. A lot of money. You know, yeah, and a lot of uh surveillance, yeah, there was, <laughs> <laughs> there was, there was a lot, <laughs> but uh, so at this time, you're, you're robbing drug dealers, right? Now, mm -hmm. you know, your father's a knocking around guy. How, how old are you when your father gets killed? I don't know, I was in my 30s. He got killed in 95, you know, so I was in my middle 30s when he got killed. Could you tell me a little about that war, how that war started? Well, the war started really in the 80s when uh, Petriaca died. Raymond Petriaca Sr. passed away, 85. He gave everything to his son. His son took it over. And, um, you know, the guys in Boston didn't like that because the power was down in Rhode Island. 
And his son was weak. So the Boston guys made a move on the family to take it over. They killed Billy Grasso. They uh, they shot Frankie Salami. He survived. And from there, it all started to escalate. By the time I come home in 90, some of the stuff was already settled, but uh, it just started flared up again. There was a murder. And after that murder, I really got involved with everything. And then, uh, you know, from there on, it was just uh, bloody warfare from that time on. A lot of murders out there. A lot of murders. A lot of murders in Boston. Now, I, I was away with uh, a Vinny uh, the Animal Ferrara. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Vinny Ferrara. And uh, I tell you, he, see, he seemed like a sweetheart. I really don't know much about him. I know he was from Boston. I think he was a captain. No, he was a capo. Right? Because when the Boston guys made that move, you know, he was one of the bosses in Boston. Yeah. So how big was he? A boss? He was a boss? Well, what happened... What they did, the Boston guys, there was uh, they made Joe Russo a consul year. Vinny was a captain. There was another captain underneath him, under Joe. And, uh, yeah, he was being a capo, made him a boss in the neighborhood. He was running an then. He was running a little Italy. He took over the Angelo's business. Yeah, he was a heavyweight up here, Vinny. Yeah, I'll tell you. And when I was away with him, you know, he was, he was a hell of a guy, sweetheart of a guy. But uh, – you know, there was word he had a reputation in the street. Oh, he did. Yeah, he did. Yeah. So, so this uh, this war, obviously, uh, you know, uh, there's a war, and your father is, uh, I guess, you are on one side, so and and there's two sides. Well, what happened? The old faction was fighting with the new faction, and the old faction had three rebel crews that were coming after us. Uh, me and my father were both with the same people, but I had my own crews then. When my father got killed, I already had all my own crews. I was moving around pretty good. I was making big money. Uh, my father was working with me a little. He was in the North then. I was up at Somerville and Method in the other areas. And, uh, you know, right up until the 99 happened. Once the 99 happened, that's when I stepped back in the North then because my father wasn't there anymore. I didn't want to lose control of the neighborhood. So I, I stepped back in where he was after he got killed. Now, if I'm going to if I'm getting too far ahead, let me know. All right. Uh, now the thing is, now when they killed your father, and I think it's to your your two uncles, right? No, they killed my father, my brother Roman, my cousin Anthony, and Sonny Pelosi was like an uncle to us. So so obviously. They, they they try to whack out a lot of power. They did. They whacked out a lot of power. Yeah. That was that was a lot of power right there. Four guys, one shot. You know what? Yeah. Let's get rid yeah. of them. So when something like that happens, you know what? Are you straight out at this time? No, at that time I wasn't. I was proposed in the Patriarca family, but I wasn't straight enough. though. Okay. Now something like this happens. You know what? They just killed my father, my uncle, uh, you know, four people that are very close to me. What, what do you do? Like something like that. It's either you get revenge or you know what? Okay, you got to make a plan to survive. How am I going to do this? Well, what I did immediately is I went, as soon as my father was buried, I went right back on the street in the neighborhoods to make sure that I kept control of everything that he had in the neighborhood. Uh, my cousins helped me with that. And I want that everybody to know that I was in the neighborhood now, that I was taken over. You know, they all knew me anyway in the neighborhood. You know, I was born there. I grew up with these people. But now that he was gone, I had to show strength in the neighborhood and my crews in the other neighborhoods. So I didn't lay down. I picked myself right up and I went right out and we started grabbing everything. That's what you have to do in the life, Jimmy. No matter what happens, you got to show strength in the street. I, and obviously you got to get more guys on your side, right? You got to align yourself yeah. with more guys. Because yep. you, need, you need numbers now. Yep. Well, at that time, I did have numbers. I had a big, uh, uh, you know, the Irish guys were working with me. I had crews all over. You know, I had a crew down in Vernon, Connecticut, all the way up to Walls, Maine. I had guys. So I, I was moving around pretty good. We were making money. I was down in Springfield. I, I was moving around. Uh, but, yeah, I did have to consolidate a lot of things. I had to pull more people under my umbrella at the time. But it was really easy to do. 
they all came in voluntarily, and that was it. They were with me now. So that's how I worked it. So what's the next move now? Obviously, you're looking for revenge. No, I wasn't, to be honest with you. Okay. I really wasn't. Sadly to say that uh, Vinny Perez, he didn't actually shoot, but he was with the shooters. And uh, Damien were under me. So when this happened, I had told them to stay out of the neighborhood till I straightened the beef over my father. So they went to Charlestown to the 99, you know, thinking they'll be out of the North End for a day or two till we straighten the beef out. That happened the night before. And who, who comes walking in there? My father, brother, and the whole crew. You know, they came down, sitting at the table. Uh, they called me. They were panicking. I said, pay the bill. Did they see you? Pay the bill or go out the side door. I said, there's 200 people in there. You know, get out of there. But at that time, Damien had called his father. Then his father was on the way down. You know, his father was a little nuts, and he just went off. Hmm. You know. And uh, so, and what ends up happening to this guy uh, anyway? The Clementes got life. The son and the father got life in the state. Uh, Vinny Perez did a year for the gun. He had a gun on him. And that was it. So they're both upstate, the two shooters. You know. now, 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 tell me the story, you know what I mean? How, you know, you're originally a Boston guy, and I heard stories like this before. And eventually you end up in Philadelphia, and you get straightened out with the Philadelphia mob. Now, you know, I'd say the 70s, the 80s, the 60s, if there was going to be a transfer or uh, let's say the Gambinos wanted a guy in Jersey or uh, down in Florida, you know, they would make all those decisions. Mine didn't happen like that. I was proposing the Patriarca family. A lot of our enemies got picked up or were killed, and we were having some problems inside our own faction. And I didn't like what was going on, so I reached out to New York, through uh, Frank Giggsy, Gambino guy. And he went to talk to Pete Gotti. And Pete said, you know, tell Bobby there's nothing I could do for him right now. You know the commission rules. You just can't step into other people's territory. That's what it's all about. You know that, Jimmy. Sure. You know? So uh, I ended up going down to Philly. I hit it off with those guys, with Jory Molino. I got proposed. I got made. And shortly after that, I became a cop. And we started making my guys. Hmm. But I never lived in Philly. I never, I'm not a Philly guy. Now, now, now the thing is, because I want the people out there to understand now, you know, what proposed means. You know, he mm -hmm. proposed means he became a member of the family. And what he did was he burnt the saint in his hand. Okay. And uh, he became a brother to a Bagada, a family. Okay. Yeah. A crime family. And yeah. uh, you know what? I mean, just tell the people out there, if you can, I know you, you, you probably spoke about a hundred times, how special that is to be a part of the mob, that ceremony, burning that saint in your hand, and now you're in a brotherhood. Just to tell them how special that is at that time. Well, you know, Jimmy, and a lot of the New York people that watch this show that have been in the neighborhoods with these big guys, with associates, guys coming up, how hard it is to actually be accepted and taken into that life. You know, in the whole country, maybe at one time there was five, six thousand May guys. Now there ain't there ain't a speck of that left. To actually become proposed and to be taken into a family is a great honor. It's a great honor to a street guy, you know, and that that was something that I was seeking. Now, a lot of people told me up in Boston not to make a move. I was strong enough. But you know, if you don't have that button, Jimmy, you don't get the same respect. You really don't, you know. So I went and got that button, and my guys got made underneath me, all Boston guys. But it's a privilege and an honor when they prick your finger, you burn that saint, and you brought it to something. You know, people all over the world belong to different organizations, Illuminati, even the Moose Club, Knights of Columbus. They have to take oaths because they want to be part of it. They want to belong. And that's what we do at Cousin Ostrom. And, and, and I'm sure you actually remember the date. The actual date I got made? Yes. 
No, I don't. <laughs> no? No. Really? Jimmy, I'm so bad. I got a problem with time and dates. I get yeah. confused. A lot of guys actually even remember the date. Yeah, see, no, I didn't remember that. I remember it was nice out. Yeah. In the summer. I remember that. That's about all I remember. So 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 now you're with the Philly mob. Yeah. And uh what's going on in the Philly mob? At this time, you know what? You mentioned Ralph Natale <clears throat> this time. Is Ralph Natale on the street at this time? Ralph was down there. I actually met for, I met with Ralph first uh at the pub in New Jersey, Cherry Hill. And I met Ralph a few times. Then I ended up going down and meeting Joey and Georgie and all the other guys down there. Uh, Ralph was on the street probably six or eight months when I first went down. And then Ralph got picked up. When Ralph gets picked up, you know, Joey takes over the family. But everybody knows now that it was always Joey's family, that Ralph was only his front guy. You know, so, uh, you know, Joey pulled me in. I was already proposed when Ralph was out. Ralph is gone now. Joey pulls me in. Joey's my boss. That's how was uh, how, how how was Ralph Natale on the street? Well, you know, I, I liked him on the street. I respected him. Uh, I met him through one of my guys uh, that actually I proposed in, in my crew. He passed away now, Frankie. And he, a lot of these guys did time with Ralph. They said he did good time. He covered himself very well. When I met him, he was carrying himself very well. You know, you know how the new introductions are. Everybody's at their best, Jimmy. You've yeah. been around that your whole life. Yeah. And that's what I saw from him every time I was with him. You know, because he knew we were serious. We were coming down from Boston. He knew we just got out of a war, too. So, you know, Ralphie was a good guy in that. We gave a lot of respect. Yeah, no, the reason I asked you, because I met Ralphie. I was in jail with Ralphie. And yeah. sometimes guys are different from the street. When they're in jail, yeah. You know? uh, I mean, when I was with Ralphie, Ralphie seemed like he was a really nice guy. I mean, you could see that he also had a big ego. Yeah, oh yeah, he did. Yeah, he had a big ego. He but uh, you know, I ne I never met Joe Molino before. But uh, you know what? How's Joe Molino anyway? I mean, as a person, I love Joey. I used to love going down there. You know, we you know we we were just normal guys. Love going out, going drinking, partying, the women. You know what we did, Jim. Yeah. You know what I mean, Jimmy? This is what we did. And, <laughs> uh, you know, me and Joe, were the, we were the same age. And uh, it was good. It was good coming up with that crew. It really was. I love those guys down there. And uh, how did this whole, like, fall apart? What was the story of it falling apart? You know, you know what I mean? I think, uh, who was it? Ron Pevity? All right, what happens is I'm down there. Uh, Joey and I, you know, we were separate. So I had my faction in Boston and, you know, the Philly guys with Joey were in Philly. Even though Joey was my boss, but I still had my own little faction up in Boston. And, you know, the feds couldn't get me. The whole time, Ronnie's working with the feds, the state police, and they, you know, he slides right in with Joey. So now we first talked that we weren't going to have any interstate business, no bookmaking, no nothing. Then all of a sudden this Ronnie Previty comes along, which I didn't like that guy. Didn't like him. And, uh, you know, Joey's throwing this guy at me. Because he's supposed to be an earner and he wants this guy to earn with me. And I was known to be a big uh, cocaine guy up in Boston. Ronnie knew that anyway. He was with the feds. So, uh he just pushed Joey into a deal with me to get me involved. And that's how this whole thing crumbled. And he and he ends up wearing a wire. Oh, he wore wires. I ended up in an FBI office. I was on tape, wire, everything. And it's amazing because, you know what, uh, a lot of guys in the street, whether they're captains, whether they're a boss, if you're the goose with the golden egg, for some reason they want to accept you. They don't care who you are. You know what? Pull him and he's got money. We'll take him, you know? Yeah, but see, I didn't have that attitude with this guy, Jimmy. Yeah. You know, I didn't like Ronnie. I thought he was a snake. You know, I just, I didn't like his appearance. I don't like anything about him. Joey had made him a couple. I grabbed him one night. We were at a party. I said, you're a couple. Where's your crew? I'm a cop of the gene. Where's your crew? Where are your guys? You know? Oh, don't worry. He said, I got guys. I said, Ronnie, introduce you to all my guys. Where are your guys? We're at a party. I knew he was full of shit. 
Joey made him a capo because you know, Jimmy, if he wasn't, he wouldn't be able to speak to me. Yeah. You know how that works. Yeah. Joey would have to put him under somebody else. So would have had to go through the other capos. And Joey didn't want anybody to know what business we were doing together. And, he, and, and even if he was just a wise guy, he would have had to go to his captain just to talk to you. He would have to. Yep. But this is why Joey made him a captain. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. I don't know why Joey did that, but he did it. It was, you know, over money. He wanted to make money, Joey. And, he looked and, at him as an earner. Meanwhile, he took us all down. Wow. So, so anyway, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Joey. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead, Bobby. Finish up. So anyway, the investigation is going on in Boston. When the drugs came into it, I pushed all my guys back. I went up front because I didn't want my guys to get in trouble with this. We had a bad feeling with this guy. And uh, I ended up taking the pinch. So in that pinch, how much time he got? When I first went to trial, I got 20 years, 235 months. I won an appeal. I slid through the cracks. You know, they changed the guidelines in the feds. What was that, 2006? That was uh, about four. Well, well, you were doing what, 65%, 85%? 85%, but I think it was 2004 or six. They actually changed the guidelines. And in Boston, so I won an appeal on that first trial, go back to trial, I lose again. Hmm. See what they did, Jimmy? They separated. There was the Molino faction and the Luisi faction of Boston. They separated us to make us vote bosses. Hmm. That's what the feds did. Because if you look at any of these things, I was the boss up here. I was part of the Bruno Scafo faction. So this is what they did to get my time up with the old guidelines. Hmm. Now, when the uh, I, I won the next appeal, the guidelines had changed. They took 48, even though I lost the second trial, Jimmy, they had to take 48 months off, 47 months off for leadership. That's how I got out earlier. Yeah. Hmm. So, at this time, you're, you stood up. You're standing up right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, you didn't come forward. No, what happened? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the story. No. I get picked up on this case with Joey and Ronnie. It's only 10 to 12 years. Okay. So, I'm looking just to plea. I didn't go do my time. I was with uh, a guy who used to be partners with. He was a main guy in the Petriaca family. And he came to me, he said, Bobby, did you hear this murder indictment was coming down? I said, no, I didn't hear anything about that. He said, ask your lawyer. So I talked to my lawyer about it. Two weeks later, he comes to the prison with Monty Bedroll, who was an ex-USA from the Boston office. He went into private practice, and thank God he ended up going in with my lawyer's office. So Marty came down. He said, Bobby, I got bad news for you. As soon as this uh, grand jury uh, is over, they're going to come and supersede you on another murder charge. I said, really? He says, yeah, all your friends are ratting on you. He said, I'll try to get you the 10th or 12th, but I can't, um, I can't guarantee that you're going to get out. He says, you're going to end up doing life. They got your cold. He said, they're laughing about it up there. So you got to make a decision. I said, well, I'm not going to be a rat. So I stopped talking to him. And um, two weeks later, I'm in my cell, Jimmy, my stomach's turning. He told me my friends were ratting on me. And I decided to go talk. And I ended up sitting with the FBI. And I sat with them for a few months. But the deal fell apart. And uh, I ended up going back to trial. Keeping it real. Hmm. And uh, so how much time did you get for that? Like I said, I got the 235, you know, uh, the first trial. And then I ended up all out the end of 15-8. And I did 13-9 uh, with the good time. So what did you do total in your lifetime? Oh, I only did a little county ship before that, Jimmy. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, I always got out on bail. My father had people, representatives yeah. used to call. I used to get out all the time. I got to be honest with you. My father did take care of that. So. Yeah. So uh, 
Now, event eventually, you had to go into witness protection, right? Yes, I did. How how was it? It, it was excellent when I went in. It was good. Yeah, it was good. You know, they came to me over the Ghana Rod Heist in 1990. You know, that's the biggest art heist in the world. That's you know what? I am so amazed with that heist because mm -hmm. till, till this day they really don't know who did it. And I was away with what's his name? The guy uh with the swords, Connor. Oh yeah, Miles Connor. Yeah. Miles Connor. I was away with him yeah. uh, back in McKean. I'll tell you, amazing guy. And uh, love to play the guitar. Very uh, a little strange, mm -hmm. but uh, I mean, this guy he was a master thief too. Yeah, big art thief. He was you know? a big art thief. But that and, that heist that heist was amazing. The way they did that. Yeah, it was. Well, you, it's a funny story because I'm sitting on the, uh, uh, we're up at the safe house. I'm sitting on the couch with the uh, unk, who was going to be my underboss. And uh, Miles Connors on TV. He turns around to me. He says, I know where the paintings are buried. I say, get out of here. He says, yeah, they're under a slab in Florida. No, nah, believe me, Jimmy, I had enough money in the room to go fly to Florida, buy the house, and dig it up. But I didn't know the value of it then. I didn't move swag. I wasn't in that business. I didn't have our people. But at that time, we were dealing with New York and Philadelphia, so... I figured, you know, that I can move it. And uh, sad to say, I didn't follow up on it, Jim. Because I would have known where it was buried and I would have went and got it. Until this day, I don't think they ever found a piece. No. No. It's all rumors. It's all it is is rumors. Wow. I tell you, it's amazing because those pieces must be somewhere uh, in another country, somewhere hanging on a wall. Yeah. That, I'll tell you, that's the case that got me in the Woodsec program. That's why I brought it up. Now, I'm in Allenwood, Pennsylvania. That's where I end up my bit. I told you I was down there with Gerard Bellafuri. Oh, so 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 you were in Allenwood. I, yeah. was in Allen, I was in Allenwood. That's actually where I ended my time. Yeah, I was, me too. Yeah. Yeah, I, was, I was in one unit, Allenwood. And, uh, you know, at Cinturon, who was there? Was, uh, was Fink there? Fink. I the CEO Fink. The CEO Fink. I don't remember. But uh, I tell you, wasn't a bad spot. No, it wasn't bad because I was. Uh, they had me in Minnesota. They had me in Arizona for seven years where Sammy was. I was there for seven years, and I wanted to see my family. I didn't see my daughter for years, and uh, so I went to Allenwood to get visits, and my mother was taking my daughter down. Which was, was uh, how about Flea? Was Flea there? Yeah, I know that name. Flea? I definitely know that name. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I'll tell you, yeah. When I was uh, you know, when I was doing time, I played a lot of cards, pea knuckle, read some mm -hmm. books, you know, programs, stuff like that. But uh, you know, you know how it is. Oh, I know, I know. So after I talked about the art museum. There was a kid up here, Rico Ponzo. He was an enemy. We would look at the kill him, you know. And they came to me and they said, we want to know where you're going to go because it wasn't that I was going in the program because you're going to get subpoenaed to go to the trial, this kid's trial. I said, I never committed a crime with him. I said, you know, I wanted to kill him. He was my enemy, but I never committed a crime with him. Actually, I almost got him a few times. Slipped right away. But anyway, long story short. Uh, they said, listen, Bobby, you were the boss up there at the time. Because they weren't even looking at the Patriarca family at the time, Jimmy, because they were all in all disarray. You know, because the guy that I was with in the Patriarca family, and he's still a dear friend of mine, was away. If he was home, I would have never strayed, you know. But um, since you were the boss at the time, we want you to sit on the trial and just give us the outline. If you do that, we'll push with them, with the Connecticut office, and we'll put you in the program. I said, well, you're going to subpoena me anyway, and I'm going to take the fifth, so I'm going to talk. I just did 15, 14 years, and I'm not doing another day for this kid. Agavish, he wasn't a May guy. He was a renegade. So, <clears throat> long story short, that's how I get in the program. 
when I got in the program, Jimmy, they took care of everything. Bought me vehicles, construction tools, apartment, all brand new furniture. Spent 13000 on my teeth because you know how bad it is in prison. Yeah. You know, all the talk, everything I needed. It was amazing. It's amazing what these people did. And, and, and the thing is, too, you never testified against no one. No, I never did. Yeah, so so uh, you know that yeah. wasn't a, yeah that wasn't a bad deal. No, no. And uh, but the thing is, growing up in North End, tell me about it. Tell me uh, how it is over there because I think it's a little more. I think it's like New York City in a way. It is. It is. You know, it was very mob oriented there. You know, and they said at one time the North End was the safest place to grow up in the country. It was in one of the magazines. And it was just amazing with all the coffee shops, the restaurants, all the tourists coming in. I love growing up there. You know, I'm a city guy. I love the city, Jim. Me too. I can't get used to grass and trees. I can't, I can't do it, you know. <laughs> I'm the same way. I, lo I love the city. I really do. And you know what? I love being around people. Yeah, well, you got to remember, like your neighborhood too, when you were a kid, everybody knew each other. Yes. You ought to be careful what you did because the other mothers, they call each other, the grandmothers, yep. the aunts. It was a community. It was like a family. That'll never be again, Jimmy, the way that we grew up. Yep. In the way they're not done. Yep. It'll never be like that again. I drove in there with Polly about a month ago. I didn't recognize one person. Well, not one person. You believe that? It's like my old neighborhood. It's the same yeah. thing. Yeah. All young college kids, professionals. I don't know nobody. Yeah. And I, I tell you, you know what? I did a lot of time with uh, Boston guys and uh, all the, the guys I did time with. Uh, really, all the Boston guys I did time with were legitimate tough guys. Yeah. And they were all legitimate Good guys. They yep. really were. I mean, I don't think I ran into one bad uh, Boston guy that was like a real scumbag. I don't think so. No, there wasn't many. Let me tell you, you know, well, you know, I was with wise guys all over the place. You know that, Jimmy. And uh, even the wise guys, there's nothing like Boston guys. They're like, we're like a different breed up here. And we, and all the Boston guys I was away, I tell you, you know why? Uh they weren't afraid to stick nobody. No. They'll stick. They'll stick you in a minute. No, they really I, would. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. That's how it is. And and you know when the feds, all the Boston guys stick together. Even if they don't, don't like a guy, if a Boston guy's in trouble, twenty of them are gonna come. So, how about uh, how long do you know your sidekick, Paulie? Paulie was a young kid. He used to hang around with my uh, brothers. And my my younger cousins, so I've known Paulie for years since he was a young kid. Paulie always tells a story. You know, they were like thirteen years old. I had got my license. How I used to take him to the movies. My brothers drop him off and everything. Paulie always remembered shit like that. You know, he's a good kid, Paulie. I love him. And uh, when we when I came back in the, in the nineties and I was building my crew, Paulie wasn't with us right away. But when I went back in the North End, I pulled him back in with us. Because he's the type of kid, he's like a little bulldog. If I tell him, Paulie, go talk to this guy and take care of this, not even a question. So it was good to have guys like Paulie around me. So when I seen that in him and I seen his loyalty to me, you know, I took him in, I gave him a button. Nice. You know, Paulie's a great kid. He's not a wise guy's wise guy. And, and like many of the guys out there today aren't, you know that, Jimmy. But he he was strong enough and good enough to to be a micro. That's for damn sure. And let me tell you, no matter what I did, it didn't matter. He found me, and we've been together ever since. To me, he's like a little brother. Now, when you were away into the program, you also uh, you became a minister, no? Yeah. What happened? Um, Why I was in and I and I was in Arizona. I got a degree in theology. I wrote a Christian book. And I put it up on Amazon now, God's Plans Revealed by Robert Luisi. So I, I wrote a Christian book. When I came out, um, 
the churches that I visited in Tennessee, because that's supposed to be the Bible Belt, right down there. I gave the book to a few pastors, a few of them read it, and they wanted me to come and teach in their church. And I ended up teaching in a black church outside of Memphis. Uh, Bishop uh, uh, Coleman was my next door neighbor. Beautiful man. I started praying in tongues and everything with him. Gave him the book. He says, I want you in my church. Will you do that? I said, absolutely. So he made me an assistant pastor in his church. And I was teaching. Uh, that didn't last too long. I had other ideas and other things I wanted to do. While I was at Tennessee, I had a TV show on Channel 6, a Christian show. And I had a Christian radio station. I used to go on once a week. I was always uh, into this YouTube technology thing. I knew that this was the way to get the word of God out. So rather than just preaching to maybe 200 people in a church, I wanted to be on here, maybe teach it to thousands. But while I was down there, I met a beautiful woman from there, born and raised in Tennessee, and uh, got married. But, uh, you know, I just got out of prison, Jimmy. I wasn't ready for it. She had three kids. I loved their kids and everything, but I just wasn't ready to be married at that time. You did a lot of times. You can understand that. Of course. You know, everybody told me there's a Bob you had done a long time. You're going to be with a woman. You're going to think you're in love. You're going to want to marry her. And it's not going to be real. And they were right. They were right, you know. Jumped into a little too fast. And the whole time I was down there, Jimmy, I wanted just to come home. And that was in my heart, too. You know, I got three, had three kids of my own at that time. One of my, my oldest daughter passed away not long ago. No, I'm sorry to hear that. No, no thank you. And um, that, that, That's a heartbreaker. Yeah, it was. That destroyed me. I could imagine. You know, it didn't matter. You know, when you're on the street, Jimmy, you got that callus over your heart, you know. It didn't matter how many people we killed or do what we had to do. But when it when it's yours, I, I just couldn't believe it. Yeah, that's a, that's a heartbreak. Rip me apart. I feel for you. Apart. And uh, so tell me about when did you decide to give your life to God? Because I know you're a Christian and I know, uh, you know you gave your life to God. Tell me a little bit about that. How about when you were a kid? Did your mother, did you go to church? Well, you know, my mother was, never took us to church. She pushed us out the door every Sunday. She thought we were going to church, but we were actually going to smoke cigarettes. <laughs> I don't even know how, how, how I received my thing to get confirmation and communion and everything. You know? No, seriously. And, uh, cause my mother worked hard. She always did. My mother was great. And, uh, what happened in 1980, my mother started with that charismatic movement, and uh, she ended up having a Bible study in our house. You know, my mother's a healer, prays in tongues, does all that. That's where we got it from, you know. And uh, I used to laugh. I used to think they were all crazy. You know, but my first wife, she started getting into it, praying in tongues and everything, but it never really touched me. And you know the path that I ended up taking, you know. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, you know the path that I took. So I went the opposite way. But 1998, 15 months before I got arrested, I had a spiritual experience with a demonic being that lasted over eight hours. And uh, I seen guys I killed, you know, went over a lot of things, but this thing was terrible. Couldn't get rid of it. Although using Jesus' name, because I was smart enough, because I did go to some of my mother's Bible studies. Uh, every time I used Jesus' name, this thing would regress. And I seen the strength and power in his name. But I asked him, he says, you're here. You know, thinking it's Satan. I said, is Jesus coming? He said, no. So after struggling with this thing for so long, I ended up calling my mother. She come over with the pastor. They prayed over me. I took the host that night, and I gave my life over to Jesus Christ. Now, you know, Jimmy, I still had to go on the street and be a boss. You can't run away from that. 
You know, I say it all the time. You can't go out and say, hey, I'm a Christian now. I quit. <laughs> not going to happen. You're going to be in a trunk, you know. So uh, for 15 months, I was struggling, walking that toddling fence. And the day I got picked up, I got to tell you the truth, I was happy. I felt it was over. I felt I had an excuse to be out of this life. You felt you felt relieved. You yeah. Could, because you could really be yourself now. You know, I tell the story all the time. I My house was built in a little ledge in rock. We had to go up a lot of stairs to get to my front door. When they cuffed me and they took me outside, I felt like a yoke broke off my shoulders. A weight you couldn't believe. It just broke off. And I was like, wow, what's this? I'm smiling as they put me in the car. Cuffed with the hand on my I'm smiling. They must have thought I was crazy. But I said, that's God. It's over. That I knew when they put me in that car, when that thing broke, that it was over. Is that amazing? So I went in, and you know as well as I do, you can't hide behind a Bible in prison. You got it. We're all men, you know? Absolutely. You know, a lot of fights in there. You know how familiar people get in there, how they act. And um, long story short, I still was able to, though, teach Bible classes, read my Bible, in between getting shipped around. Finally ended up in Arizona, got my degree in theology, and wrote my book. Nice. That's what happened to me, Jim. And the name of the book is God's Plans Revealed? Yep. Well, it's up on Amazon. God's Plans Revealed. Check it out, Bobby Louise. You got to check out that book, guys. And uh, also, uh, how about, did you ever kill anybody? <laughs> I mean, I'm just curious. What, what do you think, brother? I'm a murderer. I'll admit that. Yeah. I'm a murderer. Well, I'm just curious. But the thing is, you know what? Also, you know what? Like you come forward. The people out there got to know how hard it is to come forward. You know what? Everyone thinks it's so easy. It's not so easy because what you're doing is you're fighting a battle inside. You really yeah. don't You really don't want to come forward. But the thing is, you know what? After you come forward, you feel so much better because you got your life back. Well, it's like a confession. You know, it's like when you, you know, I don't believe in going to a priest and confess, and I don't believe in that. That's not what the Bible teaches us. But it's kind of like that. You get everything off your chest. The problem I had, Jimmy, is I didn't tell them everything. My negotiations broke down. You know, so it was weird because uh, when I first went in, they were giving me a Sammy the Bull deal. Hmm. Cat me a 10, give me five, and let me out the door. Every time I talked about a murder, my family or something went on. They come back, oh, well, you know, we're looking at a 15 cap. We're looking at this. We're looking at that. Sammy the Bull gets picked up with that ecstasy, ecstasy shit in Arizona. This is at the time of proffering. They come back again now. See what Sammy just did? We got to give you more time. I said, you're going to give me more time? So what the? I don't want to swear on your show. So what has Sammy got to do with me? I was swearing at them. I said, no, nah, this is not, you know. This nonsense is going to stop with you people. From that point, I just started fighting them. You know, I just stopped telling them. Just started fighting them. What happened with me, I'm sitting in Plymouth. I decide to talk. So they sent my lawyer with three names of people that we killed. They want to know the caliber of the guns. So I gave them the calibers of the guns. They says, all right, tell Bobby, come in, everything matches, you know. So I know about those three murders. They're asking their names. I told them those three murders. They wanted a few other things I didn't want to talk about between me and you. And uh, like I said, I just got to be a little careful. But the feds know I'm a murderer. I am a murderer. Hmm. There's a lot of things that I can't talk about hmm. that I won't, you know. And, uh, you know, tell me the feeling of, you know, 
unfortunately, your father gets killed with mm-hmm. you know, some family members. How do you, like when that happened, I can't really imagine how you felt at that time. I'm saying, God forbid someone kills someone I love. It, 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 forget about it. It's going to be a fucking war. I'm saying, I, I, I yeah. mean, I mean. Well, I got to be honest with you. I really didn't feel anything, Jimmy. You know, I, I wasn't a good person then. Uh, I was egotistical, a narcissist, self-centered, didn't really care too much about anything. My father was doing his own thing. He was a gangster. They were all gangsters. They got shot. I lost a lot of guys in my crew and my friends. That's how I take that. It wasn't until my daughter's that that I actually fell apart. Yeah, that's um, not, yeah, yeah. That's uh, definitely a heartbreaker. Until I found Christ, I had no empathy, nothing. I I can't even believe how bad of a person I actually was on the street. I can't believe that. I cannot believe it. I ha- I had some conscience, or I would have did a lot worse things that I already did, you know. So I, I it's just, uh, it, you know, I'm honest and I tell the truth about everything. And I know a lot of people like, look at this guy. That's his father. That's his brother. Look at they got killed. He don't even care. It's not that I didn't care. It's just part of the life, Jimmy. That's what I believe. That's it. There's nothing that I could do. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Well, Bobby, the, the little time I know you, you're a hell of a guy. Thank and you. Uh, you know what? God bless you. You know what? You gave your life to God. You turned it around. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you're a role model for many people, including myself. That's for sure. Oh, praise God. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. And uh, so what do you think about the mob today? Well, you know... I'm going to talk about Boston. I don't want to talk too much about New York, but I do know a little what's going on over there. It's watered down. You know, at our age, I grew up with men. I was around old timers. A lot of these guys that are out there now didn't have that experience, Jimmy, like we did. You know, and I think the, you know it's more watered down. Uh, of course, the mob doesn't have the power that it did in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. That's over. And in Boston, it's uh, there's still a mob here. There's still Philly guys up here. They're still up here. Some of my old crew are still here. They're running around. I don't know what they're doing. But I can't imagine they could be making big money anymore. You know as well as I do, if you're not a drug dealer on the street today, you ain't making no money. Yeah, that's where all the money is in the drugs today. Yeah. That's for sure. How about uh, what do you what? How do you compare the mob in Italy compared to the mob in America? I don't think there's a comparison, to be honest with you. That's mafiosa over there. They still have the old ways in them. They still have the vendettas in them. Those guys will kill you in a minute. Guys today, they want to dress up and pretend to be gangsters like John Gotti. You know. It's all Hollywood now, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's de- it, it's definitely not what it used to be. No, it's not. It's not. I, ha- have you ever watched any of these TV shows uh, like the Kimura? I was watching that. I was actually dating a girl not long ago, and she turned me on to it. And I watched three of them were in English, but the rest of them I couldn't get in English for some reason. I don't know why. But, uh, you know, it's a lot like us, but they are no, more ruthless over there. Yeah. Oh, they're more ruthless over there, and they get the young kids very early yeah. over there. You know I mean, like maybe four, six years old, they mm-hmm. get them, and they teach them at a very young age, you know, compared to over there. Yeah. Yeah. But if any of you guys have any uh, questions for Bobby, put it in the chat. I'll throw it up there. Bobby can answer some of your questions. And uh, how is your, uh, tell me, what's your favorite food? Mayan. I just, yeah, I, I, I like steak and potatoes. I got to be honest with you. Steak and, uh, how, how's the bread in Boston? Unbelievable. Is it? Yeah, oh, yeah. A lot of good bread up there. Yeah. I'm going to come down there one day. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring like a couple of loaves of, of uh, Brooklyn bread to you. Yeah. You know, I know the water is better in New York. I know everything's better over there. I'm dying to have some bread over there. That'd be nice, Jimmy. But I'm going to take you to my neighborhood. The restaurants in there are phenomenal. The food. You know, I got to say some of the best restaurants in the world are in Boston. You know that. Now, I, listen, I'm looking forward to coming there because I want to sit down with you and Paul Tanzo. Oh, yeah, you know, definitely. I want to I want to sit down and have a nice dinner with you guys. Yeah. And uh, it's gonna happen. I got another question. Yeah. So what, what's your choice? Uh, the pistol or the revolver? Well, I got to be honest with you. I used to go out with uh, 380 and a 38. Okay. That's how I used to go out, my friend. Interesting, because uh, yeah, because the Harry piece would probably just be a thirty-eight snub nose because it was small enough. I just put it on my back because I was a big guy. Oh, my other gun was a three eighty. Yeah, three eighty is nice. We got fifteen shot. Three eighty. No, I, I had a sig. It was uh, seven in the clip and one in the chamber. It was uh, beautiful. Okay, so you guys throw some questions out there for Bobby, and he'll give you some answers. Let's see uh, what they got for you over here. Yeah, the revolvers are uh, like a Mad Hatter's gun. Okay, let's see. Now, I got one guy that says, now when you were out there, you were robbing the drug dealers. You were also selling, selling the drugs to Bobby, like back in the day? No, we, you know, I didn't rob too much. It was more shaking them down, you know. I mean, we would take from them. Don't get me wrong, you know. But uh, I, I got a good connection right away with the Colombians. Hmm. Right away, it came in real fast, and uh, I was making more money selling it. I didn't have to do those other things anymore, you know. So that that museum heist. Yeah. Now. Do you know, like, the people who were supposedly be behind that? Yeah. The story I that I know, if it's true, yeah, I know all the players. Yeah. Because, you know what, I watched that heist, and, you know, when they do scores like that, like, I'm so fascinated with things like that. Well, you know, I did a show on that with Steve Kirkchen. Now, he's really the expert on that. Uh he, he's a Pulitzer Prize winner, Boston Globe uh, reporter, retired now. And uh, he wrote a book, Master Thieves. I was in the book. Uh, that's how I got back involved in all of this with him. I did a few um, documentaries on the uh, Gotti Museum. I'm really shocked that I wasn't in that video they made for Netflix, but that's all right. Now, this guy says... Who was the craziest guy in your crew? I really don't want to say because he's still on the street. I don't want to say okay. his name. Okay. Let's see what else we got over here. All right, here's, here's one. How about, did you know Whitey Bolger? Never had any dealings with him. Okay. I mean, back in the day, because you're from Boston, I'm sure you heard a lot of stories about him. Heard a lot of stories. There was always a rumors that he was a rat. A lot of people knew that, you know, he was getting information. I heard even some wise guys called him for information a few times. But we didn't know. They didn't know he was playing it the way he was playing it. Was he one guy that, like, a lot of guys really wanted to stay away from because he really made a reputation for himself out there? Well, let me tell you, being Italian, being a man guy, could care less about Whitey Bulger. You know that. He was only an associate. He was under D Danny, Larry, Jerry. He was an associate. He was with the, with the Hill Gang. But him, Whitey himself was a very dangerous man. He was a gangster. You know, he was a gangster's gangster, Whitey. He really was. But uh, we didn't have to fear him. We didn't care about him. There's another guy I was away with, and uh, I was with him in Lewisburg Penitentiary. This guy I respected 
I had the old, utmost respect for him. And uh, I sold with him in Lewisburg for a little while, and I had so much fun with him. His name was Chucky Flynn. Yeah, Chucky Flynn. Yep. How is he out there? Oh, I heard a lot of stories about Chucky. A lot of stories growing up with him, you know. How old is Chucky now? Did he pass away? Yeah, Chucky passed away. Yeah, he passed. That's right. I remember that. When yeah. I, yeah, when I did some time with Chucky, uh, I was selling with him in Lewisburg and J Block. And I was a young kid. You know, I went in. I was 23 years old. And uh, I used to get the dental floss, okay? And I would wake up in the morning before him, and I would set booby traps. No. <laughs> and when he when he got up, he would trip and fall over things. What the fuck is this kid doing? This fucking kid. <laughs> but I, I had a lot of fun with him. Chucky Flynn. Chucky Flynn was a good guy. I was with another guy from Boston, uh, Junior Pangaro. I love Junior. Here's another one, Stephen Lillis. Stephen Lillis. That sounds familiar. Another uh, Stephen Shea. Oh yeah, well the Shea brothers. Yeah. yeah. Stephen was a friend of mine. Uh, the brother Jason. You know they were nice guys. If I'm even saying the name right. And, I'm uh, still mad now, Jimmy. You gotta like you know you gotta understand that. Yeah. Another <laughs> one, uh, Dicky Donovan. Dicky Donovan. I know that name. Yeah, I was away with him. Another, another tough guy out there, Ricky Spalinga. Richie Spalinga. Yep. He was yeah, a he was. Guy. he was a boxer. Yep. Well known. Yep. But Bobby, I'm not going to keep you on here too long. We got an hour, two minutes. I appreciate this interview. And uh, I one more time, guys. If you have any questions for Bobby Louisi, I also want to plug his book. His book is called. What is it again, Bobby? God's plan revealed. God's plan revealed. And how can I we love get it that? Oh, you just go right up to Amazon. It's on Amazon. It's in Kindle. It's in paperback. And also, check out the Bobby Louisi show. If you can, give him a sub. Let's build his channel. He's a great Please. guy. Uh, you know, one time wise guy uh, gave his life to God, doing the right thing now. And uh, next, next week, in a couple of days, I'll also be uh, interviewing his sidekick. Paul Tanzo. But yeah. these guys are really two good Boston guys. And, uh, you know, let's uh, sub to their channel and, uh, you know, see their channel grow. Thank you so much for having me on tonight, brother. Hey, Bobby, I really appreciate it. It was a great interview. Thank and you. Uh, thanks for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. Anytime. I'm here for you, Jim. You know that. And, and I, can't, I can't wait for you to come up. And we have 641 people in the chat. Whoa, praise God. That's good. 641. That's good. So all you people, the Bobby Louisi show, let's give him a sub. Let's, uh, you know, also become a part of the, the Louisi family too. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we all, support, we all support each other over here. Yep. All right, Bobby. Well, listen, have a good night. Tell Paul I said hi. Thank you for the interview. All right, great. Love Thank you, brother. God bless. God bless. I'll see you soon. Okay, that was Bobby Louisi. Bobby Louisi, hell of a guy. And Boston guy, I tell you, a Boston guy that eventually went down to Philadelphia, got straightened out, became a captain, had his own crew. And, you know, things aren't always going the way we're playing things. You know, how, you know, eventually everything crumbles down and your life uh, takes a fall and you got to build it back up. But Bobby's a hell of a guy. I thank all you guys for showing up tonight. Thank you for your support. 600 and something people in the chat. You guys are the best. I love you guys. I also have some new interviews coming up. You're really going to love these people that I uh, have lined up for you. Paul Tanzo is one of them. I'm going to have police off the cuff. I have Liz Grable. She's the author of I Still Rise. And maybe we're also going to see 
Rita Giganti again, hopefully. With that said, I love you guys. Thanks for showing up. You guys are the best. And I'll see you on my next video. Bye, guys.